was yesterday great? Was yesterday great? It was absolutely amazing. I mean, it was amazing. Goodness. So like over 200 people, we absolutely filled the fellowship hall over there. Um, uh, gosh, I guess two or three years ago, Tom, Tom Fizemeyer shared with me, I've got a colleague, Dr. Carol Kaminsky, and she does this thing called Casket Empty. And so we began to introduce that, begin to plan for it, and it was an incredible day. Yeah. We had people saying, like, I learned so much. Well, her ability to be able to, to capture and speak and share and offer information that you can kind of take is amazing. So yeah, exactly. So we thought it would be good if, uh, if she could speak today, right? How about that? That'd be awesome. That's a great <laughs> idea, don't you think so? So... <laughs> Um, Dr. Carol Kaminsky, she's professor of Old Testament at Gordon-Conwell, and uh, she is here with us today. And I just invite you, like, get your Bibles out, what, right. whatever, digital Bible, doesn't make mm -hmm. any difference. Um, get your note paper out, write on your neighbor's arm, whatever you need to do, <laughs> because you're going to be blessed. Would you welcome Amen. to Gateway today Dr. Carol Kaminsky as she comes this morning. Well, it is wonderful to be here, and for those who were there yesterday, so I didn't scare you off <laughs> with, with that full-on day, but it really is great blessing to be here and to share with you from the Scriptures, and we're actually going to be looking at Chronicles. I love that passage about Jehoshaphat, and it's one of my favorite in Chronicles, but uh, this is, uh, we're looking at King Hezekiah this morning, and I want to read just a few verses. I'll be sharing some of the story as we go through, but let me read some of the passage for you as begin. And this is King Hezekiah, it's in the eighth century BC, and he is about to celebrate the Passover. So that's kind of where it is, and let me read some of these verses. So I'm gonna be selective, but it gives you a sense of the story. So Second Chronicles chapter 30, and verse 1, now Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover to the Lord of God, the God of Israel. And then I'm going to pick up verses 6 to 12. The couriers went through all Israel and Judah with the letters from the hand of the king and his princes, even according to the command of the king, saying, O sons of Israel, return to the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, that he may return to those of you who have escaped and are left from the hands of the kings of Assyria. Do not be like your forefathers and your brothers who are unfaithful to the Lord your God, and so that he may made them a horror as you see. Verse 8, do not stiffen your neck like your fathers, but yield to the Lord and enter into his sanctuary, which he, which he consecrated forever, and serve the Lord your God that his burning anger may turn away from you. For if you return to the Lord your God, your brothers and your sons will find compassion for the Lord your God is gracious and compassionate, and he will not turn his face away from you if you return to him. Verse 10, so the couriers passed from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh as far as Zebulun. But they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. Nevertheless, some men from Asher, Manasseh, and Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. Verse 12, the hand of God was also on Judah to give them one heart and to do what the king and the princes commanded. And then I'm picking up the story in verse 18. For a multitude of the people, even many from Ephraim and Manasseh, Iscar and Zebulon, had not purified themselves, yet they ate of the Passover, otherwise than prescribed. For Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, May the good Lord pardon everyone who prepares his heart to seek God, the Lord God of his fathers, though not according to the purification rules. Verse 20. So the Lord heard Hezekiah and healed the people. And the sons of Israel present in Jerusalem celebrated the feast of unleavened bread for seven days with great joy. Let me open us in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you have given us. We thank you, Lord, that your mercies are new every morning. And Father, I pray this morning as we look at King Hezekiah, Lord, that you would open up the scriptures to us. And Lord, that you would teach us new things about yourself and that you would teach us how to live according to your ways. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So a number of years ago, um, well, actually six years ago, Facebook came up with the emojis. You know, the, the like, they came up with six of them, like, love, ha-ha, wow, sad, and angry. And you might think that the like emoji was kind of one of the more popular ones, but here's what they found out. They found out that the anger one was five times more profitable than the like. Wall Street Journal uh, wrote an article about a year ago and they said Facebook tried to make its platform uh, a healthier place, it got angrier instead. Then, yeah, amen, can I hear an amen? Then a year ago, or just uh, the New York Times had an article, a nation on hold wants to speak with a manager. <laughs> And, and this article was about some of the ridiculous things that were happening in our culture. And she starts with someone just kind of losing it because there wasn't the type of blue cheese that he was used to. And the other thing they noticed was that this article had over a million reads. And they said, this is really hitting a nerve in our culture. Uh, ben Sass, a, a senator from Nebraska, wrote a book a few years ago called Them, Why We Hate Each Other and How to Heal. And you don't need me to tell you this because we've lived through the pandemic and we had times where there was anger over whether you wore a mask or you didn't wear a mask, whether you were vaccinated or whether you're unvaccinated. We can also have disputes over whether we are a Black Lives Matter, an All Lives Matter or a Blue Lives Matter. We can have disputes whether you watch CNN or whether you watch Fox News. And what happens is all you have to do is say one of those words and we immediately put someone into a tribe. You're in my tribe or you're not in my tribe. You'll notice that I mentioned both the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times just to confuse you. <laughs> So the question is when we are getting kind of this anger and we're seeing it not only in terms of the pandemic, but we can think about it politically and of course elections are coming up. I wanna ask us the question this morning, how do we respond and what does God want us to do in this context? Well, I wanna suggest that the story about King Hezekiah has a lot to teach us about God's, how God wants us to respond in these kind of times, and especially when we are having someone or a group of people who are not our tribe. And so let me just share with you what happens in this story. So the time is the eighth century BC. For those who were there yesterday, this is the time of the Southern Kingdom. And we are in the eighth century with King Hezekiah, his uh, Southern Kingdom ruling in Jerusalem. And it's important just to understand the history for a moment because what has happened is we have both a northern kingdom in Israel and we have a southern kingdom. The northern kingdom has had 200 years of idolatry beginning in 930 all the way to 722. The Assyrians came against the northern kingdom. They dispersed people. They brought foreigners in there. And this northern kingdom, they've been worshiping idols for 200 years. So Hezekiah is king in the south and the north has been taken over by the Assyrians. They've had population kind of shifting. And so King Hezekiah now has become king after a difficult time with his father reigning. And even in their most recent history during Ahaz, the north had come and killed thousands. So that's the scene. And what we find in this story is King Hezekiah sends an invitation to the northern tribes to invite them to the Passover. And you're like, what on earth is this king doing? These are other tribes and they have different political views because they've had different kings, they have different religious views and he's going to invite them to the Passover. And I read to you, he sends letters all the way north and as far north as you can go. Now, King Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah, and he wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh. And so the question is, why does he do this? I want to suggest that our first principle this morning is reconciliation begins with an invitation. It begins with an invitation, and Hezekiah is inviting them 
to pass, he's crossing boundaries of tribal boundaries of just deep animosity. So how does he do this? And why does he do this? There was another reality that was greater than his own tribal animosities. And the greater reality is there is one people of God, not two. And it governs his worldview. And I want to suggest to us, it's got to be foremost in our relationships with each other. That means that what unites us is far greater than what divides us. Therefore, when we, are, we need to cross those boundaries, whether it's a political boundary, whether you're Biden or Trump, whether you're red or blue, whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated, masked or unmasked, whatever it is, we've got to cross over. And he begins with an invitation. And it is not only an invitation to the Passover, but I want you to just recognize the kind of invitation this is because it is an invitation to the Passover meal. Now, they're going to come from the north and the Passover meal is going to be celebrated, but where is it going to be celebrated? Where do you eat it? They're not eating it under a tent with paper plates over there. They're coming to your home. They're having a meal and they're actually going to stay for seven days. Uh, I love uh, Chevy Chase Christmas Vacation. I, love, I think I, why I love it is coming from Australia, we, didn't cut, we had fake Christmas trees because it's, you know, 100 degrees during Christmas. And my husband has uh, seven brothers and sisters, family of eight, and they have their own Griswold family Christmas where the whole family goes out in the middle of up in Maine somewhere and they go hunting for the perfect Christmas tree. So I, I, every time I see that, I laugh. But, but I also <laughs> remind us, Chevy Chase wants to have the family Christmas, but really, these are people he really doesn't want to have at his table. His wife's not so sure about it. Uh, we have the um, Uncle Eddie, <laughs> who has his RV and his wife, his Rottweiler, and of course, he's putting his toxic waste in the sewer. Uh, we have his mother-in-law who shaves her upper lip, lip <laughs> puts the packages, the cat, remember that, <laughs> that eats the Christmas lights and it doesn't go so well. <laughs> Having people at our table crossing the political and all our differences, this is what this story's all about, bringing people to the table. And the second thing in this story is not only are they going to invite them to come to the Passover, but the second principle, I think we need to um, have this posture in our own lives, is humbling ourselves. Because what you find here is he's going to tell them, the northerners, um, to humble themselves and to yield to the Lord. In verse 8, it says, Now do not stiffen your neck like your forefathers, but yield to the Lord and enter his sanctuary. This word yield to the Lord is actually giving the hand to God, like yielding in this invitation. But the southerners also had to humble themselves to offer the invitation in the beginning. And this idea of humbling yourself, and it comes up in verse 11, it says, some of the men of Asher, Manasseh, and Zebulon humbled themselves. This is from the famous well-known verse in Chronicles. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. So that this act of humbling oneself, both parties had to do this when they sent out the invitation. Uh, when I was back in Australia, I have a sister who's two years older than me. Uh, we grew up with a single mum, so she was the one who was trying to sort out disputes that we had. And if we got into a major dispute, she would say, go to your room. Now, she didn't mean go to your rooms. We had to sit in the one room. And she'd say, go and sort it out. And we'd sit in the room and we'd be just like, you know, for like 20 minutes. I mean, we'd wait it out half an hour, and at some point, we had to yield, <laughs> and we had to humble ourselves, and it would start by saying, well, I didn't really mean it, and you just, well, you know, and we'd negotiate. 
humbling yourself and in the posture of humbling yourself, the opposite is being stiff-necked, like that, stiff-necked. I'm not, you know, no, I will not call that person up. No, I will not, that's stiff-necked. Humbling yourself is what the northerners had to do and the southerners. Third thing we see in this story is in verse 12, we, we find is it says the hand of God was on Judah to give them one heart. And this is just quite remarkable because you're, you're in a relationship and you want, you're taking that initiative to be reconciled. It's hard, it's the hard work of these relationships when there's deep-rooted animosity or anger or hurt. But what I love about this is when the northerners are coming into Jerusalem, I mean, imagine how they felt. Some of their um, history is that the northern, the parents had actually killed some of the southerners. But what it, we're told here is God's hand was on them to give them one heart. In other words, this is the supernatural work of God. And I think we have an answer to what's going on in the culture around us because it says the hand of God was on Judah to give. This is a gift and it's the supernatural work of God to bring about the kind of posture of forgiveness. My husband's uh, sister, he has four sisters, and one of his sisters a number of years ago was um, getting divorced from her husband. She tells the story that she was in the courtroom and she said she just had this sense of anger coming over her. And she was angry about the divorce, she was angry about all the things that was happening. She wasn't a Christian and she just kind of felt it there. And she said, tells the story of when she was in the courtroom that she suddenly had this feeling of love come over her and forgiveness. And she sat there looking at her husband and she said, in, in her own heart, I, I forgive him, I forgive him. She got out of the divorce and they got divorced. On her way home, she said to herself, I don't know what just happened then, but I need to get to church to find out what happened. And her life changed that day. The supernatural, we just saw her a couple of weeks ago because we she's in New Jersey, we were at a funeral, and we have watched to see his sister become less angry and the kindness and the gentleness that's come out due to the work of God. And so I don't know who there is today in your own life that you think, oh, there's someone that I need to be reconciled with or there's someone that I've been so angry with or I've looked at their post on social media and I think, that's it, that's it, I need to distance myself. But I wanna remind us that this is the work of God in our lives and he is the one who brings about restoration. We need to lean into this. Jesus has broken the wall down and he is bringing about reconciliation. Well, the next thing I want you to see in this story is that Hezekiah, not only do we have the people coming from the north and they join the celebration, they've humbled themselves, they have sought God, they're joining the celebration meal, but the problem is, is that even before they eat the Passover, in the history of the Old Testament, that you were meant to celebrate the Passover on the first month, they were already late to the game because they are celebrating it now on the second month. But the problem is the northerners who have come down to the meal haven't purified themselves yet. And you weren't allowed to take the Passover until you'd purified yourself. Well, the Passover had a provision that if you hadn't purified yourself, you could come a month later and then you can take of it. But the problem is they've already lost the month later because they're already a month later. So what you find in this story is Hezekiah now prays for them. And it says in verse 18, for a multitude of the people, even many from Ephraim and Manasseh and Iskar and Zebulon, these are all the northern tribes, had not purified themselves, yet they ate of the Passover otherwise than prescribed. 
and I want you to notice what happens next. For Hezekiah prayed for them. So not only is the king inviting the northerners, not only are they having to receive them when they come in, but they're also now he's praying for these people who have been former enemies. And this is our next principle here. Number four is prayer. So we've had offering an invitation, humbling yourself, seeing the work of God, and now it comes to prayer and he's going to pray for them. Restoration happens through prayer. Uh, there is a book by Hikmat Kashu, Following Jesus in Turbulent Times. And Hikmat is a pastor in Lebanon, and he is working with refugees. And so they have a lot of conflict that has taken place. And refugees who are coming in are often from former enemies, deep-rooted animosity. And a good friend of mine, David Palmer, who you'll have out here at some point doing the empty seminar, he was doing some teaching over in um, Lebanon, and he met this pastor, and the pastor told a story about someone who started coming to his church. And his name was Yassir. Yassir grew up in a devout Muslim family. He was Sudanese, devout Muslim family. And he said when he was a kid, he hated the Christians. He used to think of them as the infidels. And he tells the story in this book about when he was at school, he and another friend of his got this Christian kid named Zachariah and they brought him out into the forest and they beat him up and he was screaming and they broke um, his leg and they left him for dead. Well, what happened in Yasir's life is his uncle became a Christian and then Yasir then became a Christian and it's a wonderful story to see what God was doing. Yasir was then getting persecuted from his own family, so he had to leave Sudan. So he left, and he ended up uh, in Greece and ended up becoming a pastor. He did study and became a pastor. So 25 years later, he is at a retreat in Egypt, and he's speaking. And he's sharing his testimony. And as he shares his testimony, he sees someone, a man in the front who looked kind of deformed, one eye was blind and kind of struggling, very weak. And he sees this man weeping as he's giving his testimony. And Yasir says, after he had finished speaking, he, wanted, he was curious to find out what this man was, why he was crying. So he goes up to him. And the man shows him his old Bible. And he shows him his old Bible and he shows him his name. And Yasir saw his name in his Bible. And the man said to him, I have been praying for you for 25 years. I am Zachariah, the person you left for dead. When I think about the things that we dispute over today. CNN versus Fox News, Trump or Biden or whoever the local, I think we've got to come back to what's really important. And these people in this church, in this refugee church, have got to deal with these issues day in, day out. Hezekiah prays for them, and he asks God to forgive them because they hadn't purified themselves. And then number, next point I want you to see as we go through the story. What else do we find? He says in verse 19, he said, may the good Lord pardon everyone who prepares his heart to seek God, the Lord God of his forefathers. And then this is what it says next. So the Lord heard Hezekiah and he healed the people. And I just want you to see this healing and restoration that comes from God in this story. You see, this story about King Hezekiah, uh, I mentioned that passage in 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people who are called by my name 
will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Then I will hear, forgive, and heal. This is a commentary on that verse. All the vocabulary from that verse turn up in this passage. Often we want to pray, heal our land. But I want us to recognize that the land's going to be healed when God heals people. God heals people and that's how the land is healed. And this is the hard work of reconciliation. And this is what we have to offer a world and a context in which we're living where people are dividing and disputing over everything we have an answer to those issues in the Christian community. Who do you long to see healed today? In your family? In your church community? In your relationships? And I'm not saying that this is a quick fix formula either. We all know, I mean, he was praying for him for 25 years. We know these things take time. And sometimes there isn't the full restoration, and so we've got to do it as much as we are able. I have a sister living in Australia, my only sister. Uh, we have been estranged for three years. I don't even know where she's living. I have two nieces there. It causes me great grief. But I'm also praying that God would restore what the locusts have eaten. I don't know if you've read the book called Out of a Far Country by Christopher Yuan his mother. This is, this is spoiler alert, <laughs> just so you know. But Christopher Yarn grew up in uh, Chicago, and he grew up in a family. His father was a dentist, and he had his own uh, dental practice, and he was going to go to uh, college to study dentistry and then take over the family business. His parents were both atheists, and so he ended up going to, in Atlanta, he ended up going to um, college, uh, and, but while he was in college, he ended up getting involved in kind of the wrong group. He got involved with parties and lots of drinking, um, clubs. He ended up moving into a whole gay lifestyle and multiple partners off and on, and it was just this tumultuous time in his life. While all this is happening, his mother becomes a Christian. And what she does is she decides to set up one of her bathrooms that no one used as a prayer closet. And in the book, you see pictures, you can Google it, uh, Angela Yarn prayer closet, and she sets up her bathroom with stickers and long kind of sheets of paper with prayers. She's got her Bible in there. She's got a picture in, all in the bathroom. This was her prayer closet as she prayed for the reconciliation of her son first to the Lord and to the family. And she did it for years. Well, while all this is going on in her life and then her husband becomes a Christian, when all this is going on in her life, her son ends up getting involved in dealing of drugs and he ends up in jail seven-year prison sentence. He turns up in this cell on his own and he talks about it being the worst time in his life. And while he's in this cell, there's a bed, there's a toilet sink, and then there's this old cupboard. <clears throat> and he's sitting on his bed and he sees some graffiti on the wall and it says, if you're bored, read Jeremiah 29.11. And he kind of starts rummaging through the cupboard and there's old paper plates and trash in there and he reaches in and he finds a Bible. And he reads Jeremiah 29, 11. And he said, God started to stir in my heart that there was hope for me, that God had plans for my good and for my future. And he started reading his Bible and he became a Christian, got involved in Bible studies while he was in prison. Seven years later, he's released from prison. His parents come and pick him up and they, when they're driving him back to his home in Chicago, 
he gets towards the house and he sees a yellow ribbon tied outside. You may or may not be familiar with that song, Tie a Yellow Ribbon Round the Old Oak Tree, was written about someone who was in prison and the song was his sweetheart, if she put a yellow ribbon outside when he got out of prison, that she would, he knew that she would accept him. And he told the the bus driver, and if there's no yellow ribbon, just drive by. Well, Christopher knew that song. And as he approaches, as he approaches the house, he sees the yellow ribbon and they have um, the music playing of the song, Tie a Yellow Ribbon Round the Old Oak Tree. He goes inside and he sees over a hundred yellow ribbons all over the house, people who had been praying for him. Mother and people from the church praying for him over here and God at work over here and bringing those together. Christopher Yarn ended up going to Moody Bible College. He now is a um, professor at the Moody Bible Institute. Prayer. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, I will heal, hear, and I will forgive, and I will heal the land. And so my prayer for us today is, I don't know who you have in your own life right now that you are longing to see restored. It may be a prodigal son or a daughter. It may be a prodigal mother or father or sister. But I wanna encourage you to pray and to keep praying because we work and we follow a God who answers prayer and he restores and he can even put a Bible verse in a prison at that time to bring restoration. Let me close us in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your promise that you have given in Chronicles that if we come before you and we humble ourselves and we pray and we seek your face, thank you, Father, that you promise that you will hear and that you will forgive and you will heal. And Lord, I lift up these brothers and sisters here today and I pray, Father, that you would bring restoration in those relationships where there's been struggles. And Lord, give them courage to keep on praying. And Father, I pray for anyone here who has never known you Lord, I pray that you would stir their heart to pray and to find your forgiveness and to find your healing. And so we thank you, Jesus, for all that you do in each one of our lives and the restoration that you have brought about. And we thank you and we praise you. Amen.